Well, welcome everyone tonight. Thanks for coming out. Great crowd. Uh, it's a real honor for me to introduce to you our, our speaker, Dr. Bruce Fisk, uh, who is uh, on leave of absence this year, but made a trip all the way up from uh, Lima, Peru, where he's living this year. And we're excited to have him here to, to give this, this lecture and this presentation. Uh, he's a happy man today. The, blue, the Duke Blue Devils won at Michigan State. He's a Duke grad, so he, he, you're going to catch him in a good mood. Go Heels! <laughs> uh, Bruce Fisk is one of the professors that has this unique combination uh, for me of someone who has courage and boldness in his ability to make assertions and to offer perspectives, and yet a prudent, uh, temperate, uh, uh, empathetic judgment, ability to listen to others and to learn from others and to hold his own, um, his own opinions with, with a light touch that suggests a respect for others. And that combination of being able to put that intellectual acuity and boldness together with that uh, human dimension of being respectful for others makes him, I think, a very um, unique perspective and one that uh, I think you'll uh, enjoy learning from. Many of you I know already know Bruce. He's professor of religious studies at, uh, at Westmont. He's been here since 1999. Teaches primarily in the New Testament. Uh, has done research on the Gospels. Um, has taught and written on Revelation. And is the author of a, a few books. Uh, my favorite of which is A Hitchhiker's Guide to Jesus. Reading the Gospels on the Ground. And actually that's one of the distinctive features about Bruce's work with us and his leading of many um, trips, uh, study abroad trips, particularly uh, most recently uh, the Westmont and Jerusalem program is his, <laughs> is his ability to stay close to the ground. Uh, he, do, he does not um, move far from the rhythms of life and the experiences of the people. He wants students to, to walk the streets and to eat in the diners and to hike the hills and to experience the uh, life uh, very close to um, the experience of the people in the regions and is to not float in any kind of tourist isolation from that but to, to actually engage and understand the people. He's also particularly gifted at helping us understand the history, geography, and culture of the, of the scriptures and to see that in connection with the contemporary situation uh, in Israel-Palestine uh, and his ability to get students to see how those two worlds and two realms uh, intersect and engage with one another it makes him, I think, a real um, engaging and interesting speaker, and it's a real honor for me <coughs> to introduce him at this time, uh, Dr. Fisk. Thank you, Dr. Sargent, and thank you all for coming. This is a wonderful turnout, so I'm very honored to share with you some work I've been uh, engaged in down in South America but with a focus on Jerusalem, uh, which is sort of my other home. Uh, and I'd love to walk through some ideas with you, test them out, and, um, and then maybe have some feedback. And I should have get this, got this clarified, Mark, but do we have um, room in the schedule for some Q&A? Yeah, absolutely. What's, what's our sort of target termination Tar point? Tar target time. Yeah. Uh, we, didn't, we didn't do the... Yeah, well, we should be out by midnight. Perfect. <laughs> All right. Well, the, the paper is called The Battle for Jerusalem. Does the New Testament see a future for the Holy City? A little bit of an outline. We'll walk through the contemporary scene in Jerusalem. We'll talk about the Christian battle for Jerusalem. Then we'll turn our attention, this will be the, the heavy lifting, to some biblical passages in the New Testament uh, where we see Jerusalem re referenced and, and then offer some, some conclusions, some of which I hope will provoke you to respond, uh, to push back and to, uh, to think with me and help me think better about the subject. So first, the Jerusalem report. On May 2nd, 2017, U.S. Vice President Mike Pence delivered a speech at the White House commemorating the 69th birthday of the State of Israel. On this day, he said, the fifth day in the month of Iyar in the Hebrew calendar in 1948, 
nothing short of a miracle occurred. On that day, the, in, the ancient, in the ancient and eternal homeland of the Jewish people, the state of Israel was reborn. On that day, the Jewish people's 2,000 year exile, the longest exile of any people anywhere, ended. And on that day, a prophecy literally came to pass. And I believe in my heart that God himself has fulfilled his promise to his people. The Lord God tells us in the, the old book, Behold, I will cause breath to enter into you, and ye shall live, and Israel lives today. So, Mike Pence. The vice president is quoting there at the end of that excerpt, from the King James Version of Ezekiel 37, an oracle that foretells restoration from exile for the whole house of Israel, depicted as a valley of dry bones. Ezekiel prophesies the miraculous territorial restoration of both northern and southern kingdoms and their reunification into one realm ruled by one king, David, and blessed by a restored sanctuary. For Christians like Mike Pence, the fulfillment of Ezekiel's prophecy is unfolding before us. Six times in his speech, Pence declared that the 20th century establishment of the state of Israel was an act of God. And he is similarly clear on what that means for Jerusalem. Jerusalem is, he said, the eternal undivided capital of the Jewish people in the Jewish state. In the same White House speech, Pence announced that the president was giving serious consideration into moving the American embassy in Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. Not everyone celebrates remarks such as these. On, of, of Jerusalem's 800,000 inhabitants, one third are not Jewish. Many Palestinians want a state of their own alongside Israel with East Jerusalem, including the old city, as the Palestinian capital. Thus rages a battle for Jerusalem, a city scarred by barricades and checkpoints and controlled by identity cards and riot police. Anything that challenges the status quo in the old city will provoke retaliation, as we saw in July. As we saw in July, Jerusalem's Temple Mount is often the flashpoint. So I put together here a little chronology of some events that unfolded over a two-week span in the month of July this summer. On Friday, July the 14th, three armed Arab citizens of Israel attacked Israeli border police in East Jerusalem. The assailants were pursued and killed. Two Israeli police officers die. And for the first time in years, the Israeli government closes access to the Temple Mount known to Muslims as the Noble Sanctuary. Two days later, Israel reopens the Temple Mount, but now with metal detectors at all entrances and the promise of security cameras. And the Islamic religious authorities call on the Palestinians to boycott these measures. Thousands of Muslims assemble for prayers on the streets of East Jerusalem. Protesters clash with Israeli police who respond with arrests, live fire, and live fire, but the protests only grow. A week passes. Friday, July 21st, Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas cuts off communication with Israel. Three Palestinians die in clashes with police. Three Jews die from stab wounds in the West Bank. A few days later, the 25th, the Israeli cabinet relents and calls for the removal of the new security equipment. The bodies of the attackers are released to their families on July 26th, and 10,000 Arab Israelis join the funeral. July 27th, Islamic religious authorities give approval for resumed worship at the mosque and the Palestinian street celebrates. One Friday later, men under 50 are denied access to the mosque, but thousands of women and older men gather peacefully to pray. At the end of this two week span, 11 are dead and hundreds are injured. A few pictures to, to supplement that, and you'll notice that these black and white shots are by Andrea Stewart, who sits in the second row here, and I thank her for these. And she was there at the time and took these pictures. A night shot of the city, men praying outside of the mosque compound. More men praying. Notice the police presence in the background. 
armed riot police, full presence. Sorry for those of you over there. If any of you want to come over here and change your location, you're most welcome to. And then some, some media shots, this one from Haaretz. Tear gas in the air. Like every other skirmish on Jerusalem's holy hill, this one has a context. June marked 50 years since Israel captured and occupied East Jerusalem. This iconic photograph from June 7, 1967 shows soldiers at the Western Wall after the old city was captured in what's come to be called the Six Day War. And this month, back on November 2nd, marks 100 years since Britain pledged formal support for a national home for the Jewish people in what's called the Balfour Declaration. Today, under Benjamin Netanyahu and now Donald Trump, Jewish settlement construction in East Jerusalem and the West Bank is spiking, and Palestinian home demolitions continue apace. Increasing numbers of Jewish ultra-nationalists are visiting the mosque compound under police protection. In April, during Passover, Jews for the first time sacrificed a lamb near the Temple Mount. Tensions are high and prospects for a just peace are dimming. Clashes and casualties, like we saw in July, are sadly predictable. Section 2, the Christian battle for Jerusalem. There is, alas, another battle for Jerusalem to which we now turn. In this battle, Christian soldiers peer across a hermeneutical divide. On one side are pro-Palestinian Christians who see no reason to privilege Jews over non-Jews in the land. They regard the modern state of Israel mostly as a predictable outcome of colonialism and nationalism. And they see the birth of modern Israel as good news for Jews, but a catastrophe for the land's indigenous inhabitants. Staring back across the metaphorical green line are pro-Israel Christian Zionists, like Mike Pence who celebrate more than a century of Jewish migration to the Holy Land, celebrate not simply because individual Jews needed safe haven from pogroms and anti-Semitism, but because God gave Jews the land, because God's hand is at work, because biblical prophecy is being fulfilled, and because the regathered people of Israel collectively have a role to play in God's plan. So the rhetorical arrows fly both ways, Biblical grenades detonate, often in short supply is epistemic humility. That said, Christian perspectives on the present day Jerusalem cannot be reduced to a simple pro-con binary, nor is scripture always at the center of the debate, nor is every debate a war. I've tried to illustrate, you'll see it more clearly perhaps in your handout, I've tried to illustrate or depict the diversity of perspectives on uh, this question in a graphic. And I used two axes. Uh, on the horizontal axis, I asked the question, is the, the Jewish capture and, and possession of East Jerusalem a welcome or positive development or not? And on the vertical axis, is the modern city of Jewish Jerusalem an act of God or not? and had fun trying to plot and place different groups around uh, that, uh, those two axes. Don't know if it worked, um, and I would welcome uh, critique and reaction, but you'll see, for example, up in the top right-hand corner, you have various forms of Christian Zionism, as well as Jewish Zionism of the religious type, but then down in the bottom right-hand corner, not regarding the modern Jerusalem as an act of God, but nevertheless as a positive development, are secular Jewish Zionists. Uh, and so you can see how, you know, you can kind of plot these different groups. Uh, on the far left side, on the negative side, you even have some ultra-Orthodox Jews who think that the modern state of Israel and the capture of Jerusalem is actually threatening the, de the identity of, of the Jews, and, and the modern state could actually displace 
the core of Jewish identity. So you have Orthodox Jews opposing the state of Israel and opposing their actions in Jerusalem. So it's a complicated uh, scenario. Among these perspectives, we must pause over what I'm calling, and others have called, the new Christian Zionism, which is here on, on the right. So named to distinguish it from the traditional version that has echoed from so many evangelical pulpits and captured so many imaginations through books like The, the Late Great Planet Earth and uh, more recently the Left Behind series. New Christian Zionists want to reinvigorate Christian support for Israel and counter Israel's increasing alienation. So gone are the prophetic timelines, the end times preoccupation, the speculative interpretation of current events, the maximal territorial claims, and the overt zeal for a third temple. Less eschatology and alarmism, more soteriology and scholarship. Daryl Bach of Dallas Seminary conveys the basic idea. He says, Israel has a corporate future in God's plan, and as a nation has a right to, be in the, uh, to land in the Middle East, and Israel also has a function to, uh, sorry, has a right to function as a nation and be recognized as such in the world. New Christian Zionism is certainly tighter and less apocalyptic, but it is still fundamentally about Jewish real estate or ethnic, national, territorial Israel. The return of Jews to the land and their establishment of the state of Israel, says McDermott, uh, one of the proponents and the editor of a book on the subject, the return of, of the Jews to the land and the establishment of the state of Israel are partial fulfillments of biblical prophecy, part of God's design for what may, might be a long era of eschatological fulfillment. Now exactly how exactly how the people of Israel continue to be significant for the history of redemption, and how the land of Israel continues to be important for God's providential purposes is not spelled out. But what is spelled out is that the modern state of Israel is an act of God. Craig Blazing, also of Dallas Seminary, writes, the modern restoration of Israel to national status after so long a dispersion needs to be understood as an act of God in continuity with the divine plan for an ethnic national territory, Israel and the nations of the world. So we come then to part three, visions of Jerusalem in the New Testament. Visions, uh, Christians who struggle for Jerusalem are motivated by various theologies. Orthodox, liberation, reformed, dispensational, peace, etc. As well as by Islamophobia, the war on terror, the Holocaust, a perceived affinity with the Jewish people, self-interest, and of course by various Bible verses. Among them, Psalm 122, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Psalm 137, if I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand wither. Isaiah 62, for Zion's sake I will not keep silent. For Jerusalem's sake I will not rest. Now the Old Testament, of course, is flush with promises of land, prophecies of territorial restoration, and visions of Jerusalem's renewed glory. According to the Hebrew prophets, the nations would one day embrace the God of Israel and make pilgrimage to Zion. Just a few sound bites on the screen there. Isaiah 2, in the days to come, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established. Or Isaiah 66, they shall bring all your kindred from all the nations to my holy mountain, Jerusalem. Jeremiah 31, the days are coming when the city shall be rebuilt for the Lord. And many other texts could be cited. But then came Jesus. What did Jesus and his followers think about Jewish national political restoration? Did the New Testament foresee a continuing role for Jerusalem in the story of human redemption? Do the land of Israel and the city of Jerusalem persist in a New Testament vision of the future? Rather than survey the entire New Testament corpus, however, we shall lower the bar and limit ourselves to the Gospels, Acts, and Revelation. Not because Paul and the rest have nothing to offer, but because we can leave some stones unturned 
uh, and still make our case and be out of here before midnight. <laughs> so first, the Gospel of Mark. One searches Mark's Gospel in vain for explicit affirmations about the land or visions of a future Jerusalem. If you have a copy of the paper, I'm going to skip a few paragraphs. Passages that do not withstand scrutiny, though they have sometimes been thought to support a future Jerusalem. Only in Mark 11, verse 17, there on the right side of your screen, when Jesus demonstrates in the temple, do we have possible evidence in the Gospel of Mark that Mark's Jesus assumed a future Jerusalem with a functional temple? In order to explain his table-turning indictment and indignation, Jesus borrows imagery from both Isaiah 56 and Jeremiah 7 on the right side of the screen. In particular, he says, Is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations? That's Isaiah. But you have made it a den of robbers. That's Jeremiah. In the eschatological vision of Isaiah, Torah observant foreigners would make pilgrimage to Jerusalem's temple to worship Yahweh alongside the regathered exiles of Israel. Gentiles would be welcome in the house of prayer for all the nations, but of course on Jewish terms. Now if Isaiah's oracle and its larger context inspired the temple demonstration by Jesus, then we might conclude that Jesus' hopes for the temple's future may have been high. There will come a day when it will be a house of prayer for all the nations. Fueling these hopes may have been another prophet, Zechariah, also on the screen, who likewise spoke of the eschatological vindication and purification of Jerusalem, and the pilgrimage of the nations. Zechariah, the entire book, ends with an image of the temple's purity. He says, there shall no longer be traitors in the house of the Lord of hosts on that day. Was Jesus stepping into that prophecy and, and fulfilling it? One might conclude then that by driving out the merchants, Mark's Jesus clears the way figuratively for the restored worship of the kingdom of God, in which all nations will participate, along with the returning exiles of Israel. In other words, Jesus' action may anticipate the eschatological redemption of Jerusalem. On the other hand, you'll hear that a few times today, <laughs> Jesus says nothing here about Jerusalem. He certainly indicts the temple's guardians, but whether he foresaw a, re a future restored national capital and renewed national sovereignty is from this passage impossible to determine. So we turn to Matthew's Gospel. Signs of land consciousness are more overt in Matthew's Gospel, though still rare. It's, it's working fine, I blanked it. So yeah, no worries. <laughs> Heidi's awesome. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus famously announces, something we've all heard, a blessing on the meek. <coughs> According to most English versions, the meek will inherit what? The earth. The Greek word Matthew uses, however, could also mean the land, which is surely the sense of Psalm 37, which Jesus appears to be quoting. A psalm that's about living safely and well, not on the earth, but in the land of promise. And there's more than enough evidence in Psalm 137, 30, 37 to, to suggest that. And Jesus appears to be quoting Psalm 37. In context, Jesus' words rebuked the powerful in Israel and in Rome and promised great reversal. Was Jesus repeating the psalmist's promise as if to say that Israelites... Get that? Israelites, faithful to him, would in the coming kingdom inherit real estate in Palestine? Inherit the land? Or did he mean to expand the old promise in the Psalms of territory beyond the borders of Israel and even redefine what it would take to inherit it? A similar question arises from Matthew chapter 8, paralleled in Luke 13. Texts that share a saying of Jesus Matthew and Luke do, but deploy it in very different contexts. Reading from Matthew's side, verse 11, I tell you, many will come from east and west 
and sit at table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. Matthew's Jesus, you may remember the story of the centurion. Matthew's Jesus, surprised by the insight of this Roman centurion, contrasts here faithless sons of the kingdom with many others, Gentiles, outsiders, who will one day come from east and west to sit at table. In Luke, Jesus is referring less to the inclusion of Gentiles than to the return of diaspora Israel at the end of the age. But whether converted Gentiles or restored Israelites, Jesus depicts these outsiders ascending to Jerusalem where a feast awaits. What is unclear, at least to me, however, is whether this banquet, this feast, is a metaphor for salvation or a literal scenario according to which Jerusalem and Israel would be the eschatological center of the world. A literal banquet hosted by Jesus and the risen patriarchs would require a menu, tablecloths, corkscrews, and a restored Jerusalem to accommodate the guests. A metaphorical banquet for salvation would not. Another passage that could, could imply Again, the political, physical restoration of Jerusalem is in Matthew 19, paralleled in Luke 22. Let me read the, the, the Matthean piece. Peter says, we've left everything and followed you. What's in it for us? Jesus says, in the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man is seated on the, on the throne of his glory, you who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. The 12 will enjoy preeminence in the coming kingdom, says Jesus with roles that might presuppose, might presuppose, restored tribal territories. There are, however, reasons to doubt that Matthew expected to see 13 literal thrones installed in a restored palace. Jesus uses hyperbole elsewhere to dramatize the coming reversal, and his language here, echoing both Daniel 7 and Psalm uh, 122, is clearly apocalyptic. And here I just attempt to show some of the echoes of both Daniel 7 and Psalm uh, 122 from which Jesus has drawn many of the images in this saying. Neither the glorious throne nor the twelve thrones of the apostles need be literal armchairs any more than Jesus' return requires a cloudy day, flying horses, or a bronze sword in his teeth. So whether this scenario assumes the political reconstitution of a 12-tribe nation-state, or whether something more symbolic would suffice, is again difficult to discern. In favor of a political nationalistic restoration, we note Matthew's decidedly Jewish orientation, his use of the word Israel elsewhere. Israel's prophets, moreover, regularly spoke of the ingathering of Israel's 12 tribes. That was a theme in the Old Testament. As did later Jewish authors. To take but one example, here is Psalms of Solomon 17. This is not in your Bible. This is a later Jewish writing, about 100 years or so before Jesus. Psalm, the Psalms of Solomon includes famously uh, Psalm 17. And uh, I put it on the screen for you to give an example uh, of Jews looking to God to purify Jerusalem and restore the tribes to the land. Notice the reference in verse 26. He shall judge the tribes of the people. Verse 28, he shall dis distribute them according to the, their tribes upon the land. Given this sort of Jewish context in the Old Testament and in later Jewish literature of, of Jesus' day, the number 12 was surely significant for Jesus and for Matthew. The 12 disciples symbolized, promised, and for Jesus began the regathering of the 12 tribes. But again, we face unanswered questions. Was Jesus' expectation of Israel's regathering traditional, straightforward, literal, or was it more revisionist? That is, did Jesus adopt Jewish eschatology like what we see on the screen? Uh, did he adopt Jewish eschatology unaltered, or did he reconceive it, reimagine it? Were the twelve meant to be a picture of Israel's future literal political restoration, 
Or did Jesus regard his inner circle as the tribes of Israel now being restored? Hope you can feel the, the tension or the difference between those two possibilities. But now we turn to Luke Acts. Luke's readers are struck by the prominence of Jerusalem in both halves of his two-volume work. In the paper, I give you some samplings of the prominence of the city of Jerusalem, both in the Gospel and in Acts, but we'll skip that. If Luke makes Jerusalem prominent, which he does, Luke also highlights the city's destruction, which makes us wonder what might come next. Luke could have signaled that the functions and prerogatives of the destroyed city and its temple have now been transferred to Jesus. He is the new Jerusalem. Or to his community. They are the new Jerusalem. He doesn't do that. On the contrary, there are a handful of texts that incline us to think that Luke foresaw the city's physical restoration. First among them, oh, these are the texts we're skipping. First among them, sorry, is Luke chapter 21 on the screen. First, uh, sorry, first among them is the apocalyptic discourse here before us. Uh, it's found in Mark, in Luke, in Matthew. We're focusing on Luke's version, in which we find down there in verse uh, 25, Jerusalem will be trampled on, verse 24, trampled on by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. In Mark's vision, the temple's destruction seems to be followed immediately by the Son of Man's coming. Luke, by contrast, resists imminent eschatology in order to create temporal space for the mission of the church. You read Luke's Gospel, you, you sense we're going to be around for a while. So get busy. He says in verse 24, Jerusalem will be trampled until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. But what happens after the trampling? Will Jerusalem be restored? Might we today, as Christian Zionists would assure us, be witnessing that restoration, the end of the times of the Gentiles? More than a few interpreters have offered assurance that Jesus ruled out such a resurgent Jerusalem. Uh, exhibit A, a Jesuit publication of the late 19th century, which goes as follows. 1827 years have passed since the prediction of Jesus of Nazareth was fulfilled. And he's referring here to Luke chapter 21. Namely, that Jerusalem would be destroyed, and that the Jews would be led away to be slaves among all the nations, and that they would remain in, in the dispersion till the end of the world. As for a rebuilt Jerusalem, which would become the center of a reconstituted state of Israel, we must add that this is contrary to the prediction of Christ himself. So there's a 19th century Jesuit perspective saying that Luke 21 rules out a future Jerusalem. For this Jesuit scholar, hostile to the emerging aspirations of secular Jewish Zionism, Luke 21 foretold Jerusalem's destruction but ruled out its restoration. But did this writer ignore the broader context of Luke Acts? Two passages in particular seem relevant. Luke 13 and Acts 3, on either side there of Luke 21. Luke 13, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you will not see me until the time comes when you say, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. You will not see me until the time. Or Acts 3, repent. This is Peter preaching in Jerusalem. Repent, turn to God, so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. He may send the Messiah who must remain in heaven until the time of universal restoration. If these three texts are mutually illuminating, which seems reasonable, the trampling of Jerusalem in the middle column, Luke 21, may not be, and the times of the Gentiles there, may not be permanent arrangements. Rather, they shall give way as a result of Israel's corporate repentance and her welcome of the Messiah to times of refreshing, refreshing restoration and redemption. Christian Zionists thus tally these texts in their column as support for the future literal restoration of the people, land, and city of Jerusalem, to which 
non-Zionist interpreters reply, not so fast. First, Peter's appeal in Acts 3 to the men of Israel is conditional. That is to say, if Jerusalem does not repent, it will not enjoy restoration. There is no guarantee. Second, although Luke describes the fall of Jerusalem in the middle column in terms of armies and swords, there is no corresponding physical description of Jerusalem's restoration. Acts 3 refers to a time of refreshment and the restoration of all things. But such language is not obviously or necessarily territorial. Nor is it clear that the blessings of Acts 3 have territory in view. It seems rather that the Abrahamic blessing that Peter promises to the, the cities, the, the residents of Jerusalem, is repentance, not real estate. These objections noted, it still seems likely to me that Luke envisioned limits on the times of the Gentiles. But again, what would come next? Did Luke foresee the restoration of the Jewish people? city of Jerusalem, the temple, a reborn Jewish state, or did he see through a glass darkly only a mysterious future that resists detailed description? Happily, this question, if not its answer, appears in Acts chapter 1, in a, in a remarkable post-resurrection exchange between Jesus and his disciples. So volume 2 of Luke's project opens with this scenario Jesus is speaking after his resurrection to them, verse 3, about the kingdom of God. But then we get to verse 6, and the disciples say, Is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? Restore the kingdom to Israel. Jesus is talking about the kingdom of God. They want a kingdom of Israel. They seem to be expecting a political, national restoration that would coincidentally reward them handsomely for their loyalty. Their nationalistic yearnings echo the vision of Israel's prophets. They also match prevailing expectations within Second Temple Judaism, as even Luke's Gospel reminds us several times. Here's Acts 1 alongside Luke 2, where Anna is described as looking for the redemption of, of Jerusalem. Luke 19, followers of Jesus are supposing that the kingdom of God was to appear immediately as they approached Jerusalem? Or how about the disciples on the road to Emmaus? Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who doesn't know what's going on? We had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Did Jesus share his disciples' hope for restored national ind independence? Interpreters are, as expected, divided. For some, the disciples' question in Acts 1 is turned aside by the risen Lord. And the general implication is negative. Going back to that slide, Jesus replies, it's not for you to know the times or the periods that the Father has set by his own authority. You will receive power. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and beyond. Gary Burge, a prominent uh, critic of Christian Zionism, contends that Jesus flatly rejected his disciples' nationalism. On this reading, the arc of Luke's narrative works to emancipate the gospel from attachment to the land. The kingdom arrived with Jesus and expands in the power of the Spirit in the global mission of the church, far beyond tiny Israel, to the ends of the earth. So the era of ethnic particularism and nationalism is over. Sounds reasonable. It is also reasonable, however, to conclude that Jesus shared his disciples' nationalistic vision, and that it was his vision that inspired their question. Craig Keener writes, Jesus does not deny that Israel's restoration will come, contrary to the later church's de-Judaized way of reading scripture. Although the time of Israel's restoration is unknown, it, perhaps, it presumably happens when Christ comes for them. That's Keener. Christian Zionists likewise read Acts 1, 7, and 8, you will be my witnesses, it's not for you to know the time, as a dominical promise, or a promise made by Jesus, of the ultimate restoration of the kingdom to Israel in the holy city of Jerusalem. To the chagrin of all interpreters on both sides of the battle line, 
Jesus neither answers nor dismisses the disciples' question. His farewell address offers neither a clear rejection nor a clear endorsement of Jewish nationalism. If Luke's Jesus does acknowledge Israel's future restoration here, he is utterly silent about when and how it would occur and about whether in the process the definition of Israel would be transformed. We may face here, as elsewhere, an unavoidable tension. Jesus' kingdom fulfilled Israel's hopes, even as it qualified, expanded, and perhaps transcended them. I'm going to skip uh, here a couple of parables in the paper, if you have the handout. Uh, we just don't have time to cover everything. Uh, two parables of judgment in the Gospels, particularly Matthew, that don't hold out much hope for restoration. And we're going to turn to the Gospel of John. To move from the Synoptic Gospels to the world of John is to encounter a new language, to chart new conceptual paths, to hear new stories, and discover new ways of thinking about Jesus. John's Gospel is known above all for its relentless focus on Christology. Jesus appears as the embodied Word, the Son of God, through whom God's glory is manifested, through whom God gives life to the world. John's Christology, his teachings about Jesus, is explicitly tied to the nation of Israel. He zooms in on Jesus as the figure of central interest and insists that everyone and everything must find its place in the story's world only in relation to him, Jesus. All of Israel's past and the totality of the witness of scripture are absorbed into the person of Jesus. So John does not cast Israel aside. He calls Israel to embrace its high calling as witness to Christ. And so Israel's stories, the Old Testament, Abraham, Jacob, Moses, Elijah, Isaiah, David, these stories are the network within which John's narrative becomes intelligible. Israel's prior life with God becomes seamlessly integrated with the story of Jesus that John tells. So that's the, pers the meta perspective on John. Let's focus in on Jesus' encounter with the woman of Samaria, the Samaritan woman in John 4, one of many episodes in which Israel's story is central. Our interest lies particularly with Jesus' comment about the future of Jerusalem. You may know the story well. Uh, my fellow travelers to Jerusalem have drunk water from the well where this mm -hmm. took place and looked from there up to Mount Gerizim where a, a Samaritan temple once stood. The woman at the well rightly identifies a stark contrast between Samaritan and Jewish doctrine insofar as each nation, the Samaritans and the Jews, claim to be the true people of God and the guardian of the one true cultic site. There at the foot of Mount Gerizim, where a Samaritan temple once stood in the heart of Samaritan territory, Jesus solemnly challenges her claim of preeminence and affirms instead the honored place of the Jews, from whom comes salvation. An affirmation that accords fully with both Jewish prophetic traditions and early Christian proclamation. Understandably, Christian Zionists celebrate this link between Jews and salvation. In the same breath, however, Jesus announces an end to the battle over holy sites. An hour is coming, this is verse 23, an hour is coming when you, Samaritans, will worship the Father neither on Gerizim nor in Jerusalem. Jesus neither promotes Mount Zion at Gerizim's expense, nor does he denigrate Jerusalem and its temple. Instead, he announces the impending irrelevance of the entire debate and declares that the decisive turning point is not far off. The hour of which Jesus speaks in John is his passion, his crucifixion, and his exaltation. For John, Jesus is and will be the holy place, the new locus of true worship. Now, this demotion of Jerusalem in John 4.21, neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem, poses a formidable challenge to Christian Zionists. Among them, Barry Horner responds, unconvincingly in my reading, by suggesting that the coming hour refers 
not to some final state of affairs, but to a penultimate, temporary scenario that would revert to localized Jerusalem-based worship in the eschaton. So we worship in Jerusalem now, but an hour is coming when we won't, but then another hour is coming when we will. That's Barry Horner. But surely what Jesus says about worship in the near future would be more true, not less, in the age to come. It seems that for John, Israel's hopes for a restored temple have been permanently fulfilled, not in a territory, but in a person. Jesus' rejection of sacred topography is a challenge for all of us, not just for Christian Zionists. How attached should any follower of Jesus be to sacred hilltops and holy memorials? Conversely, how resistant should we be, or receptive, to the temples, shrines, and burial grounds of other traditions? Can the gospel advance only by emptying sacred sites of their meaning and detaching targeted peoples from their physical, spatial identities? Those are questions for another day. The claim here is simply that John's gospel weighs in decidedly against an eschatologically significant future for Jerusalem. Which brings us then to the book of Revelation. The city of Jerusalem takes center stage in the closing chapters of the New Testament. But a surprise is in store. The holy city has become a holy people. Moments before the curtain descends on the canonical drama, we see Jerusalem descending from heaven. Revelation 21, 1 to 14. Verse 2, I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, the New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. This Jerusalem is both bride and wife of the land. With the dimensions of a giant cube, Jerusalem descends to rest upon Ju not Judean bedrock, but on the twelve apostles. For this city consists of faithful witnesses from within is Israel and the nations. We see here not a physical city inhabited by a redeemed people, but a redeemed people inhabited by God. Let me read that again. We see here not a physical city inhabited by a redeemed people, but a redeemed people, the New Jerusalem, inhabited by God. In this city there can be no physical temple, because God and the Lamb are immediately present among God's people. Verse 22 of, of chapter 21, I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. Christian Zionists may contend that in Revelation 21 we see the new earth centered in Jerusalem. So restored earth with Jerusalem at the center. Gloriously restored as the prophets foretold. And that further to this restored Jerusalem the nations will ascend with their offerings. That would be the Christian Zionist reading of, of Revelation 21 and 22. But John shows no interest in a particular hilltop between the med and the dead. It appears, in fact, that the new Jerusalem of 21 verse 2 and the new heaven and earth of 21 verse 1, right before it, are one and the same. The restoration is a world city following the pattern already set in the oracles of Isaiah. So again, John's Jerusalem is not located in the restored cosmos. John's Jerusalem is the restored cosmos. If John's Jerusalem is a place, paradise, holy city, temple, to which the earthly city and its temples could only point. But this place is also a people, drawn from Israel and the nations. All peoples now share the blessings as children of God. Which leads us to thankfully, our conclusions. Does the New Testament see a future for the city of Jerusalem? Although our survey has hardly been comprehensive and many stones remained unturned, we shall now bravely advance four propositions. First, the future of Jerusalem is not a major theme in the New Testament. When the topic of land or of Jerusalem does come up, statements are brief, 
and often opaque. Why is this so? Did New Testament authors take Israel's territorial and political restoration so much for granted that it required no comment? Did they, living under Roman rule, avoid the topic out of political expediency? Had Jerusalem, especially after its destruction in 70, slipped off the radar for an increasingly Gentile Christian community? Did they think that all biblical land promises had been fulfilled in a previous era? Or was the future of Jerusalem neglected because Jesus had directed his followers' attention away from land, borders, and nationalism? Whatever your explanation to this non prominence of Jerusalem in the New Testament. The fact remains that for all our interest, for all the New Testament interest in eschatology, unambiguous discussions of Jerusalem's future are conspicuously absent. Second, it appears that the New Testament does not speak with one voice on the subject. As with other issues, one thinks of slavery, women in leadership, even the death of Jesus, the list could be long, there seem to be multiple perspectives. We might prefer the New Testament to be an owner's manual or a rule book, but what we have is a diverse collection, more library than book, more lively conversation than lecture, more jazz ensemble than chamber orchestra. The pages of the New Testament are filled with stories letters and visions, none of which reduce easily to principles or propositions. We should not be surprised then that when the authors of this collection pondered the eschaton, they discovered in the Old Testament imagery and visions that supported a number of happy endings, no one of which could capture all that God had in store. So third, when we pause to listen, to this conversation, this lively conversation, we hear in some voices the expectation of restoration. I think we see that in Luke Acts. While others ignore the idea or transform it or announce Jerusalem's pending irrelevance. We saw that in John. When these voices speak of Jerusalem's destruction, some of them do and some do not hint at restoration. Luke seems to hint. Matthew seems not to hint. Taking up the mantle of Israel's prophets, like Elijah following Elijah, these writers redefine Old Testament terms, extend metaphors, and transform expectations, all in the light of Jesus. The coming of Jesus challenged the reading of scripture and fired their imaginations to depict the eschaton in a variety of ways, not all of which were mutually compatible. Perspectives on Jerusalem seem to fall along a continuum with John and Luke resting comfortably at opposite ends. This is another uh, exotic thought experiment uh, where I've taken the various verses that uh, we examined in this study and kind of tried to plot them along a continuum. At the top on the right, texts that seem to assume, imply, or expect Jerusalem's restoration. Notice that all of the texts I put in that category come from Luke Acts. Down at the bottom, on the left, we have texts that seem to reject, redefine, or declare irrelevant Jerusalem's restoration. Notice that the bottom two texts come from John and Revelation. In between, we have Matthew and Mark. And of course, we could plot more verses and we could argue about the order. But this strikes me as interesting, uh, an unexpected finding of this project. Fourth, if this is even partly right, Bible warriors on both sides of the battle might want to lay down their swords. Or better, beat them into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. This is not to say that all debates about eschatology boil down to this question of Jerusalem, nor is it to say that the only obstacle to peace in the Middle East is the decision about how to share the holy city. A robust debate should continue. The stakes are high and people are getting hurt. But the multivocality of the New Testament on the question of territorial restoration, as I understand it, should 
summon Christians away from inflammatory rhetoric and binary thinking to humility, constructive dialogue, and diligence in the quest for reconciliation. All of us across the spectrum, on all sides of the debate, all of us read our Bibles selectively and operate with a de facto canon within the canon. All of us are tempted to select Bible verses that support our beliefs. And when we look to the future, moreover, we belated readers must peer into eschatological fog, as did the apostles and the prophets before us. We know a happy ending is coming. We know that truth and justice will prevail, that mourners will be comforted. But in order to say more, we, like scripture, must trade in metaphors. The kingdom of God is a garden. It's a banquet. It's a wedding. It's a harvest. It's a pilgrimage. It's a new earth. It's a city. Surely this calls us all to hermeneutical caution. Modern Jerusalem is not a stage for apocalyptic choreography. Jerusalem is a city whose residents are haunted by history, imprisoned by fear, and struggling to coexist. It does not help when Western Christians reduce this city to a prop in their version of the apocalypse. When they elevate certitude over humility, when they reduce mysteries to memes and scripture to sound bites. It does not help when they blur lines between ancient Israel and the modern state, when they offer unguarded blessings to a government whose policies promote dispossession, or when they reduce a complex conflict to a simple binary. It does not help when they tour the Holy Land but ignore half of its inhabitants, when they idealize one people and denigrate the other, when their blinded narratives locate all virtue or all vice with Israel or with Palestine. It does not help when we Bible readers hurry past inconvenient verses, when, in the words of Frederick Buechner, we remain deaf to what it would be well for us to hear. It does not help when we show more zeal for Armageddon than hunger for righteousness. Jesus wept for Jerusalem. Can we claim to follow him if our eyes are dry? Thank you very much.